First of all, a big thank you to Laura and Benjamin for this opportunity. Um, today I'm going to give my presentation about uh, the business of Egyptology, as um, Wooly has called it in his uh, <laughs> lecture. Um, I'm going to talk about the Belgian Compromise, the, the consensus or the marriage in, of, between science and empire uh, along the, the Nile uh, through the perspective of Belgian diplomacy and how they played a role in the making of the technology um, between 1830 and 1940. I conducted this research uh, in a larger uh, research consortium in Belgium in an in inter-institutional um, uh, project, which is called Pyramids of Progress, in which we have 18 people working on the disciplinary history of Belgian Egyptology against the backdrop of Belgian expansionism towards Egypt until the revolution of 52. And on a larger scale, I tried to integrate my research in a bigger questioning of what I call the Leopoldomania in uh, Belgian imperial history. So I tried to, a larger scope, uh, also include uh, non-members uh, non who were not part of the monarchy and, uh, and played a role in colonialism. Also to like to look beyond the Congo uh, as the map shows, even uh, under the reign of the first king, um, Belgium had uh, a global system of imperial projects along both uh, formal as well as informal imperial kinds of uh, endeavors. And uh, from a set, uh, perspective of history of science, I tried to give a bigger and better view at the imperial humanities rather than the exact or life sciences, which continue to dominate the field until today. Um, I also, today, I will look at three uh, specific uh, means in which the histories of science and empire are entangled. So I also have to make a Belgian compromise. Uh, and I will look at the, uh, first of all, I will look at the instrumentation. And I uh, use a specific case study for this. Um, I, will, I have looked at the travel of Eugène de Bruyssenaire de la Roustine and his quest for the Nile in the 1850s and 1860s. He was a uh, Belgian guy of lower nobility who had this kind of a orientalistic dream to go and find the sources of the Nile. Uh, for example, in 1856, he traveled along the Nile southwards uh, towards Sudan and made this beautiful uh, watercolor, which I discovered in an, uh, in the Antwerp University archive. And uh, later, uh, during his uh, second uh, trip, he meets a certain guy called Leopold de in Dongola. Uh, during this trip, he also made these sketches of uh, the Dongola fortress. Um, but when we look deeper into this question, what, who this uh, Leopold de Bear is, um, actually he was a, uh, a consular agent or a uh, commercial agent who was sent by the uh, ministry and the consul in uh, Beirut, in Syria. And he took the intelligence from the Presna about the local markets, about the prospect of arms sale, and uh, what the future of Belgian imperialism could mean in the region. And he took all this, these intelligence and all this information to the Belgian um, ministry back in Belgium. So you can see, for example, in his letter to uh, the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he writes, another thing that is lacking in Belgium, is, lacking in Belgium, is uh, having uh, Belgian consuls uh, uh, who are present in the Orient. This is information which, which comes clearly from uh, the Preussenare, since he also uh, published the same kind of information in his personal records. Then there, you also have the Preussenare's archaeology. Uh, for example, in 1863, already three years before the more famous uh, Schweinfurt expedition of 1866. Schweinfurt is, for example, a German scientist who uh, founded the Egyptian uh, Geographic Society. So three years before him, uh, the Preussenaire looks at a site in Zakari, which is in uh, Sudan, and in his letters, which are translated into German, he writes that some of the uh, pottery uh, which he finds on the site have a, uh, are wearing a signs of a cross. This is 
on its stern, cited by Addison in his 1951 research, who takes the same quotes uh, of the German translation. Um, and he uh, relates them in a bigger argumentation about Christianity and the origins of Christianity in the region. But as uh, Robinson has proved in his study on the Hamitic Thies uh, in the book The Lost Right Track, um, these kind of arguments relating to the Christian presence were integrated in a bigger uh, theory of uh, Hamitic presence in uh, the Sudan and Ethiopian region. So here you can clearly see the echo of what the first Snyder has did on the field, how he wrote about it, and how it still uh, echoes in research until the 1950s, something which has only been challenged recently uh, in uh, this compelling uh, study. The second perspective I take is how Belgian imperialism uh, was entangled with the formation of the archaeological practice and Egyptology as a disciplinary as a discipline and the disciplinary history, and therefore I look at the cultural world of Alexandria. Uh, two months ago, I, oh, in November, I was a month in um, Alexandria, and there I tried to uh, have access to the archives of the Greek and Roman Museum of Alexandria, which were only discovered in 2002, and then inventorized by a French uh, scholar uh, called Eric Gadi. Um, today, they are in the um, deposits of uh, Shalalat, and sadly enough, I haven't been able to uh, be granted access to see them. However, uh, between 2002 and 2012, a file maker inventory was made in which you can see some metadata and some uh, short descriptions of the sources, and there are also publications which tell a bit more about how. Um, the uh, Greek Museum worked and was administered. Um, these informations are this well. This info is uh, integrated in um, a data management system of our team, which is called NodeCode, in which we collect um, all sorts of uh, data relating to all the persons which are uh, related to Belgian imperialism in Egypt between 1830 and 1950. So far, we have a number of. Uh, almost 3,500 uh, actors which are related, and we have also categorized them in uh, their respective organizations in which they were uh, active. And for example, I ingested the information about um, the Greco Roman Museum, uh, its origins, its sources, and also um, who, for example, was a director or the curator. And by doing this, I can combine the findings of my research in uh, the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, for example, you can see the archival file in the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, file number uh, 1366, and then combine it with, my, uh, with what is published in the uh, reports of the museum. And so I can, for example, you can see that he was, this guy, uh, Georges Zembutaki, uh, was a candidate for the consul for the position of Consul of Belgium in Alexandria, but apparently he was also a member of the board of the General Committee of the Greek Roman Museum, and that's a way how to put <coughs> these actors into context and, and try to answer questions. Why was he, in the, in the end, uh, not nominated to be a consul? Uh, did this relate to his network in the Alexandrian cosmopolitan cultural elite as part of a member of the uh, General Committee, but also, how this takes place within the, part, the bigger picture of Belgian industrial presence since apparently between 1907 and 1914. And this is information which a colleague of mine was focusing on the uh, financial records and the, uh, public, uh, the publications on the industry and uh, business. Apparently, I was also a member of the board of the Tramways Alexandria, a big uh, tramway company in Alexandria. So, this is really where diplomacy. The cultural world and business uh, comes together. Um, a specific case in which I uh, try to also really uh, make um, this research con concrete is the case of Paul Spain and me. He was the Belgian consul in Alexandria in the beginning of the 20th century. He was also the architect of the beautiful uh, Banque Ottoman Imperial 
on the uh, Mehmet Ali Square in Alexandria. And for example, this is one of the uh, this is one example of how the sources are eventized in the LKD FileMaker system. And there you see that there is a demand to examine three cases of antiquities, um, which Monsieur Remy, so the Belgian Council in Alexandria, wants to export. Uh, and it also bears a recommendation of Lorraine, which is a famous Egyptologist of uh, Lyon in France. And um, there was also a, um, a comment which says, yes, it's without doubt uh, destined to be transported to Valerma B, which is a famous industrial in Marie-Mont in Belgium, who is also connected to Raoul Barroquet, uh, whose collection is the, uh, the base of the current uh, Musée Royal the Marie Moore, which is one of our partners in our project. And the destination, uh, the, the, the guy to who the letter is addressed is uh, the director of the British Roman Museum, the Italian uh, Poppy. So, if we look then back at the node code system we have put in place, you can also see that both Prospera Media Council, as well as the industrialists in Belgium, whatever we were, for example, investors in an Alexandrian uh, bakery, a uh, mechanic bakery uh, company. So this is again where the elites of uh, 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 an example where the elites of industry and culture uh, come together. Um, as this example also shows, there is another trace of, sadly enough, I couldn't see the real letter, which is behind this, um, this entry, but there is another letter which mentions that the Belgian consulate wants to send another uh, piece of antiquities towards Belgium in about the same period. So this might also be sent it to uh, the same one MLB. So we might be able to connect this example uh, to the previous ones. And lastly, I would also like to put a spotlight on how I tried to uh, put an extra spotlight on the indigenous contributions in Egyptology and uh, what the possibilities are in regard with the archives of the Greek Roman Museum. So, and I was also able to see some of the uh, photographs of, which were made during the inventorization mission of Renikadi. For example, uh, the, a few plants are included in these uh, files in which you can probably see uh, some information on the impact of um, 19th century and beginning of the 20th century excavations and their impact on local communities. But also uh, there were some photographs of financial sources. So um, here we can see how the museum um, had to pay some uh, local workforce, uh, labor force uh, which had worked for them, uh, also with their names and uh, the addresses which is mentioned in other sources. Um, as Stephen Quirk has already showed, the uh, hidden hands and other Egyptological progress, also in Alexandria there are some hidden hands, um, quite literally. As you can see, uh, these are uh, some um, documents which are on the uh, labor forces who worked on the Alexandrian um, sites, as the uh, pictures sub show. Uh, but sadly enough, for example, these pictures were uh, photographed are still in the archives behind the, the doors of the Shalalat uh, depository, but sadly enough, uh, I have not been able to put them into context or uh, see who these people are. Um, most of the times when people are publishing about the contributions of indigenous people or local uh, people to the formation of Egyptology, there's a lot of focus on the workforce, so the, the hands, but also the minds of the people you can see. For example, this is a source related to Ahmed Kamal Bey, uh, one of the first and most important uh, local Egyptologists. But also, in the uh, permanent, in, if I, when I looked into the uh, <laughs> summaries of the members of the permanent committee and the general committee, there are also guys like Suleiman Abani. Uh, which was a, uh, a member of the board. And when I tried to find some more information about him, there was a digitization project, <coughs> a small project of the Egyptian Gazette. And here we see, for example, that 
he was involved in um, a project which is related to burial grounds near Fort Bay Spiller, so near the Serbian site in Alexandria. So this is also a way how to put these people uh, back on the agenda of Egyptological research. So um, I hope to have you showed uh, some interesting perspectives, like three different ways, both the way uh, Egyptology or Egyptological interest was uh, instrumented by the Belgian imperial elites and by diplomacy and by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, also how Belgian actors were involved in the formation of, Belgian, of Egyptology in general and the uh, cultural world, but also how Belgian uh, industrial presence formed, uh, was a, a, a binding force in uh, these elites, and to prove how I tried to put uh, indigenous voices back on the agenda. If you want to know more, these are the social media outlets, and I thank you for your attention.